All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Davud Gozli, and in this video, I'm going to talk with you about a book called Finding Your Element, how to discover your talents and passions and transform your life. Wow. So these are really huge promises. And when a book with its title or with its introduction or the notes behind on the cover of the book, when there are huge promises like that, the question is, are they going to, the authors, or is it the, the book going to deliver on those promises? And if the book fails to deliver on the promise, or the promises it makes, does that do anything to the trust between the readers and the authors? And should we care about that trust? Are we living in societies that trust no longer plays a role? Or maybe readers don't think critically and carefully about what they read? Anyways, let's get to the book itself. This book, Finding Your Element, is a follow-up to another book, which was called The Element, and I've already reviewed that book on this channel. That book was better, in my view. It, is, it was not a, an amazing, great book, but it was better than this follow-up. And the reason is that uh, the scope of the first book, The Element, was larger. It was, it was concerned with not only personal issues, but also cultural issues. It was concerned with social matters, social concerns surrounding education, and also policy, the politics of education. And in addition to that, there were some personal anecdotes and narratives. In this book, the authors are, they want to talk to you as a person, as an individual. So they are getting their ideas and they're packaging those ideas in the form of a self-help book. Now, maybe you might think that if you're a fan of Ken Robinson, and I also like Ken Robinson, I like some of his other work. But if you're a fan of him, you might say, okay, yeah, self-help is not great, but this is better than the average self-help out there. And maybe you're right. Maybe this is better than the average self-help book. But there are some problems, some fundamental problems with the genre of self-help. And this book, I would argue, I'm going to unpack why. This book is not immune to those fundamental problems of self-help. It falls into their trap. The trap of writing for a readership that is, is different, but you're treating them as if, you are, as if they are the same. And you're giving them advice without really knowing them, without really, uh, without being able to tailor your advice to individual cases. Um, maybe it is helpful that the book has lots of exercises in it. I think there are about 15 or so exercises in total. And the point of these exercises is to make you pause, sit and reflect and reason about what you're currently doing with your life and what you want to do what you're good at doing, what you don't want to do, what you are not good at doing, and you know, taking stock and maybe taking small steps towards improving your life and being what the authors call being in your element. Okay. Now, even though the things that I dislike about the book are more and more important, they outweigh the, the things that I like, the good qualities of the book, I am going to begin talking about the good qualities of the book, the things that I like about the author's work, specifically in this, with this book. So let's begin with the things I like. The first thing that I like is how the authors correctly point out that a lot of what we need to learn is actually unlearning things. We need to unlearn. Like what? Like looking at life as a mechanical process, as, a, as something that is linear or predictable. Our lives, your life, my life, is not mechanical. We are not machines. We are not linear systems. We are not predictable. So we need to unlearn these conventional ways of thinking and we need to start thinking a little bit more creatively and out, outside of the box. In a way, in fact, in a way that uh, is more faithful to the realities of our life, not the way people talk, you know, conventional, common ways. 
something else that I like. And this applies to this book and the next book that they write, uh, Creative Schools, and the previous book. So this is something that is a theme that runs through Ken Robinson's uh, works. It's one of his main concerns. Uh, and he has touched on this both in the element, in finding your element, and in the creative schools. And that is the link between public education, public school system, public schooling, and industrialization, the industrial, industrialized character of societies. Why that link is really important? It's because public education is formed, the way it works, what it emphasizes, its priorities, are formed by not itself from within, but from without, from outside of it, from the values of an industrialized society, a society that has gone through industrialization. And the values of that, that have shaped public schooling systems, are hidden from somebody who is just looking at schooling, just looking at public education. They might not realize where those values are coming from. So it is a critique of the values of public schooling, public education, and how those values don't belong within education but come from industrialization. An industrial view, industrialized view of education is looking at it as a process of teaching people how to perform certain tasks, tasks that are predetermined, like accounting, for example, like uh, organizing or doing HR work or other forms of labor and, you know, things that are repetitive and you can determine in advance what skills you need to have. So not creative, not playful, not, you know, regarding the other aspects of human life like leisure. Um, so this critique is helpful. It's helpful to keep it in mind. And it opens up the possibility of thinking about education in other ways, alternative ways of looking at education, thinking about education. Next, I liked the critique of aptitude tests, even though that critique was better and more consistent in the previous book, The Element. But here they touch on it again, because these aptitude tests, standardized tests that are supposed to give us how much uh, skill we have, how uh, much capacity we have in certain domains in given domains like mathematics um, or language they are commercial products um, so they, they are supposed to present themselves as valuable but they are detached in a way in the way they are designed they're designed in a way that is detached from our real life activities from our personal interactions from our past decisions our actual personal histories they disregard those things. They, they disregard the context of our life and how the context, the way we are coupled with an environment is an important fact about who, how we are doing, what we are doing, how good we are at what we are doing. The authors also go against cynicism, another uh, good quality about the book. Cynicism is the attitude that maybe might show up in a uh, one way it might show up is in statements like, this is the end for me. I'm stuck in this life. There's nothing else I can do. This is one way to be cynical. Another way to be cynical is maybe you are a student or you're a graduate student having your own independent projects that you're working on. And you can be cynical when you say, oh, this topic I'm doing research on is hot I'm not interested in it, but it's fashionable, it's trendy, and I can only get a job if I do this type of research. That's one way to be cynical. If you're not interested in fashionable you know, neuroscience research, don't do it. If you're not interested in doing social psychology using structural equation models, don't do it. If you deep down realize it is not as valuable as it presents itself to be, don't do it. But if you continue to do it, Regardless of what you believe, that's a way to be cynical. So I like that this book has that kind of attitude, counter to cynicism. 
I also liked how the authors encourage you to think about your possible tribes, your peers. Who are your peers? That question is really it's worth raising that. I think it's an important uh, topic to consider. Who are your peers? Who are your possible mentors? Who can you learn from, connect with? And your future mentees, people that you mentor. There are also good anecdotes in the book. The one that maybe stands out the most is the story of El Sistema, which was uh, pioneered in uh, Venezuela by an economist who was an amateur musician. So El Sistema is an educational plan for teaching classical music, and it became the basis in Venezuela for National Youth Orchestra. Another story in the book that I wouldn't say inspiring. I don't like the word, how the word inspiring has been associated with self-help, like reading inspiring quotes and collecting inspiring quotes. But these stories add depth and richness to the book. And one of these stories is the story of Ken Robinson's father and how he dealt with physical disabilities, how he kept his um, positive attitude and spirit, especially in relation to his family. Okay, so those were the things that I liked and appreciated. Those are the, the reasons why reading the book might be worthwhile, might be worth your time. Now, the things that I dislike, the things that I'm critical, there's a challenge of giving advice to people in the form of a book that is impossible to personalize. You can't personalize uh, because readers are different. So Robinson and Eronica, they have to constantly qualify their statements. They say, this thing that we're talking about, it might work, work for you, but it might not work for you. This other thing, same, it might not work for you. Or the, the aptitude tests that you find to learn about yourself, they might be complete frauds. You know, they might be very unreliable and just there to get your money. But they might be good and they might work for you. I don't know. So they hedge and qualify constantly because they recognize that they, these things they say, they don't apply to everybody. Um, so the resources they talk about, um, even though they are critical of them, but even then, they, and they say you have to take these things with a grain of salt, they present them because what else they, can they talk about? They have to talk about general things. They have to give general recommendations. That is a trap of self-help. Anybody who writes a self-help book he must give in to the temptation of saying things that have worked for some people Maybe they have worked for them. These atomic habits have worked for me. They've saved me from, you know, bad, um, bad lifestyle, bad habits, you know. Uh, but look, the guy who has the atomic habit thing going for him, he was from an upper middle class family, or maybe he was rich. Yes, if you're a rich uh, guy living in this segment of society among these people among these friends if you're already going to a very expensive college or university yes maybe atomic habit is the next step you should take but you know it's you're kidding around if you're saying everybody everybody can uh, transform their lives using these formula so it's because of the genre and uh, robinson and ironica uh, unsurprisingly, they also end up contradicting themselves. They get to discussions of personality types because they're talking about learning about yourself. So uh, they have to touch on things like Myers-Briggs personality type or tests. In the elements, the previous book, they were they had a more profound, more nuanced perspective there. That's That book was driven by a much more uh, profound perspective, spirit. But here, they get into a very serious discussion of Myers-Briggs. Myers they consider it very seriously alongside other, other models like the astrological and Jungian theories of types. Um, let me read a passage from the book. So Robinson writes, quote, I argued in the element 
that all systems of classification have deficiencies, including MBTI, Myers-Briggs. You should approach them all critically and not try to bend yourself to fit them. If you treat them as ways of generating questions and ideas about yourself, they can be useful. If you use them to brand and limit yourself, they are not, end quote. So they are basically brainstorming tools, like talking with a friend or, or opening a dictionary and looking at words in the dictionary. How is that? How are those two ways different uh, from each other? Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? But to elaborate more on that would undermine this um, suggestion that MBTI or other forms of personality type classification might, might be useful. Anyways, uh, something else they do in the book is, which is noble, I think, is they, they, they want us to suspend our judgments. They want us to get rid of our prejudices about ourselves, our understanding, our prejudice about what we can do, what we cannot do, what our life is about what our gifts are. Uh, when the goal is to suspend your judgment, if you do that successfully, there's a temptation to impose new sets of judgments and expectations on yourself. And that's fine if you do that carefully, if that's your decision. And you, if you decide um, on things that are more suitable to you. But those decisions cannot come from a self-help author. Because the self-help author is not there. It's not there to give you feedback. If you actually are working with a mentor or a teacher, a consultant, whoever, that whoever you trust, a friend, um, they give you a suggestion and they see you do it. They see what you do, the way you try to engage with that task, and they give you feedback. And that feedback is as valuable, maybe even more valuable than the original suggestion. The author of a self-help book can only give you that original suggestion. They cannot keep track of what you do next. Okay, so now I get to the biggest problem I have with the self-help genre. The biggest problem is maybe about its after effect. What happens, it is, it is much worse what happens to us when we are disillusioned with it, when we are disillusioned with self-help? When you get disappointed and realize, you decide, when you decide that these books are not helpful to you, you might reject them in a way that is too much, that is too excessive. You might throw the baby out with the bathwater of self-help. So the self-help books are the bathwater or the programs, that might be even more expensive than just a book. What is that is the baby that you're throwing out? Um, it is that part of us that is exploited, that the good, there, there are good optimistic attitudes and tendencies within us that self-help comes and exploits, takes advantage for commercial benefits. It's kind of like falling in love with somebody who lies to you and manipulates you and cheats on you. Once you get over that love, you might decide that you are never going to fall in love again. You're never going to get into a relationship. You're never going to love someone. You're always going to be rational and calculating. So self-help works by exploiting that inner optimism that we have. That thing we have is natural. It's, it's a natural thing that we um, that is within us, I think. That's what I believe. It's an optimism. It's a tendency to trust, to, to be hopeful, to connect, to decide, to, to imagine a good future, a future that is better, a little bit better than the present moment. And to the tendency to work, decide to work towards that future. The self-help genre tricks us into believing that those tendencies should only go through these practices and these images of success. And th that those are potential is only actualized if it becomes this, if you have a big house, if you're driving a Tesla or whatever car that you like, if you're married to a supermodel, 
if you're uh, sending your, uh, I don't know, kids to these programs, whatever, whatever the image is, image of success. The resistance against those ideals of self-help is to first reject the limitations that they impose on, on success and more fundamentally to reject the idea that we need a guarantee to succeed. The guarantee of success um, isn't necessary. We don't need the guarantee to enjoy our efforts. We can work towards things even when we know that they might fail. Anyways, um, I promise to end with some recommendations and let's uh, get to those. All right, the first thing I would recommend is a documentary. It is called The Philosopher Kings. The reason why I recommend this documentary is because it's counter to the mindset of self-help, the success driven. One of the mistakes of the self-help genre is that it, it is too narrowly focused on the success of an individual and it ignores our relationships and it ignores the rest of society, the society that we are living in, the rest of our community that, and the community that we belong to. Okay, so the Philosopher Kings. Let me know what you think if you watch that. And then next recommendation is a book about the self-help genre. Uh, it's called The Art of Self-Improvement, 10 Timeless Truths by Anna Katharina Schaffner. Uh, this is a book that I've reviewed already on my channel. Um, the reason why I would recommend it is that it's bearable. It's a, it's a good way. I think it's one of the better ways of handling the, the, the type of thinking. Reading it might um, help you become immune to self-help or self and self-improvement without making you cynical. One of the good things that Schaffner does in the book is it connect, is that she connects the contemporary uh, ideas of self-help and self-improvement to older ideas of uh, ancient philosophy, for example. Uh, last, since we talked about Jungian archetypes and this book touches on them, <laughs> type personality types, not, not archetypes, but uh, personality types, I would um, suggest the works of Jung himself, because Jung is a thinker of solitude. He dealt with solitary living, living and solving problems by himself on his own. I don't like Jungians in general, but Jung himself is worthwhile. And it's a, could be, you know, it's a, it's a very complicated way of reflecting on your life gives you some resources that go in, in more depth than uh, the empty promises of, of self-help. Uh, Jungians are not as, as great, but one student of Jung that I also like and appreciate is James Hillman. James Hillman also has an attitude of, that goes counter to, uh, to our self-help culture, success culture. All right, uh, let me end the video uh, remind you of uh, my reading group uh, on Saturdays. Saturday, Saturdays at noon Eastern time. So we begin 12 o'clock Eastern time. We are currently getting to the end of the book Understanding Post-Structuralism by James Williams. And that has been really fantastic. Uh, we have recorded so far all of the discussions uh, so you can access them through Patreon. And if you join the second tier of my Patreon group community, you can uh, join the discussions. The next book I'm thinking about may be assigning uh, Deconstruction and Pragmatism, which uh, is a series of chapters written by Richard Rorty, Jacques Derrida, Simon Critchley, and uh, Ernesto Laclau. There are a couple of other alternatives, but um, I think I'd like to, for now, stay close to the theme of deconstruction and post-structuralism. This 
attitude of critical thinking and the resources, the really valuable resources that they provide. And these resources have been so misunderstood in popular culture by people like Jordan Peterson, who just completely misunderstands the, the gifts of postmodernism, the works of people like Jacques Derrida. He just doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. He misunderstands them and then he treats them as the ultimate enemy. Uh, but if you engage with them as we did, you will see the love that these thinkers have for humanity, the love that they have for clear thinking, for, um, for just doing justice to ourselves and each other. And, um, you know, the preservation of the, what, is, what is most valuable in us and our culture. Anyways, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for staying with me this long. Um, I like keeping the invitation at the end of the video because I would like to extend the invitation to join uh, the reading group to people who are attentive enough and stay with me. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading your comments on this and my other uh, videos and uh, take care of yourselves. I'll speak with you in uh, the future. Bye for now.